stand. That was fantastic. Thank you, Sean. Where'd you go? He already ran away. Um, thank you so much, Sean. So a couple of quick uh, housekeeping things. We have one more general session and then we'll go to a break. The next general session is the whole analytics team from Mullen, all the leaders of the analytics team from Mullen, and this is a pretty rock star group. So um, you definitely don't want to miss this. Um, I will say, though, that there are seats um, in here. So if you guys who are standing want to fill in, we'll give you a couple seconds to kind of roll into seats. Um, so you can sit for this last session before we take a break. But there are seats here and there are seats there. Um, so just kind of roll on in. Um, also, thanks to everyone who's tweeting. The Twitter stream is on fire. And um, that is awesome because um, there were a lot of people that wanted to be here and couldn't be here because of various reasons. And so they appreciate your tweeting. I'm getting lots of nice um, comments from people. So just if you are tweeting, use the hashtag MyTextData, M-I-T-X data, um, so that people can follow the conversation who aren't here. Additionally, all these sessions are being recorded on video by the fine folks from FCAT. And um, so they will be available after this event. So um, if you're interested in you know, seeing some of these things again, if you wanted to go back to something, you can do that as well as when we do the breakout sessions in the next segment of things. If you want to go to both and you haven't gotten cloned recently, you can go to one and then um, watch the other one on video after the event. So don't worry that you're um, not getting to see what you want to see because we know this content is amazing and you're going to want to see it all. So. Up next is the Rockstar team from Mullen, as I said. Um, we have Patrick, Jeff, Tripti, and John. They're going to um, sort of tell you where they're coming from. But as an agency, they're going to talk about um, having a multidisciplinary approach to analytics. So they're talking about it from CRM analytics, social analytics, predictive analytics, and the ways that they combine all these different perspectives on behalf of their clients to make um, for a really compelling picture and are able to really help their clients like Google, like JetBlue, like Acura, um, really shine. So take it away, Mullen. Sounds great. This up here. There we go. Let me just make sure it works. All right, it does work. Good morning, everyone. We're really excited to be here. It's rare that we get a captive audience who wants to talk about analytics and data. <laughs> Usually I get a creative guy who gets, stands up, presses play, and 30 seconds later the entire room is in tears. I usually don't get that too often, so uh, so so it's great to, to, to be here this morning. Um, Mullen Analytics has come a long way in the last two years. I, I started the I started the group two years ago with we had about six or seven people, and today we sit at over 25 analysts. And the success of Mullen, the recent success of Mullen over the last two years, has been um, uh, due to not just analytics, but this idea that we call hyper bundled. Um, this is a philosophy that we live and breathe at the agency. And what this really means is that every skill set at the agency has a seat at the table, right? Uh, that, that's come a long way from a long time ago where analytics was put in a corner and when the CMO asked a question or, or somebody asked a question would run us up and say, hey, um, what do you, can you get, get me a number like Sean was talking about earlier that can prove my point? Um, but the other thing that we're doing at Mullen is we have this, we, we believe in challenger brands, right? We want to be the inflinching champion of schoolyard underdogs that you see up there, right? And to do that, you have to be more than just a creative or media agency. You have to be able to tie everything together. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to walk you through um, a very quick overview or kind of a data story of what we're doing. So for the next three hours, um, we're, no, just kidding, not, not the next three hours. So for the next 30 minutes, we're going to walk you through a lot of stuff. We're not going to get deep into the weeds, but we just want to show you what we're doing, right? Um, I want to introduce my team to you. Um, through, through the last 17 years, 13 of, of those were, which I worked in uh, the telecom industry, the one thing that I learned is hire the best people you can afford. And I've been very fortunate to be able to go out and find those folks to help lead my team. And so you're going to hear four people speak today besides myself. You're going to hear uh, Tripti Patel and Jeff O'Neill from my digital and social analytics team. Uh, John Turner from my advanced analytics team. He spent the last 20 plus years 
running media mix modeling, 15 of those years at P&G, running one of the more profitable arms, right? And then uh, Chris Oliver there at the very end, he just joined, it, joined us this week. He spent three years at Havas Direct running that, that, that team and five years running the Tesco business, right? So I've been very fortunate to go out and find some very, very good people who are crazy enough to come work at Mullen. Um, but I'm very blessed because of that. So I'm going to walk you through segmentation real quick and what we're doing in that area. Um, our philosophy is to either take our clients' customer data or take the best syndicated research out there to try to help to understand uh, our, our clients' customers. You heard the, a couple of the previous speakers talk about really try to find and understand who your, who your best customers are. You know, it'd be surprising to you to find out that regardless of if it's an AT&T or a small startup, a lot of these companies truly don't know who their customers are because they're busy, they're busy running around trying to get the day-to-day -day, uh, taken care of, trying to get quarterly sales to meet their objectives. Uh, but a lot of times people stop to ask the simple question of, well, who's our customer and who, we are, who are we trying to go after? And so when we uh, perform segmentation for most of our clients, uh, that's really what we're trying to understand because our job is to make sure that the work we're producing is driving the desired results for our clients. So what we do is we'll take our client customer da database and we'll code it with a unique code that represents a household, right? And from there, what we'll do is we'll tie it back to a number of different uh, data sets like the Nielsen uh, TV sample base, which then allows us to go out and help us plan our media better, uh, tools like MRI, Experian, and a host of other different data sets, right? And this allows us to, uh, to uh, <coughs> perform segmentation and deliver it relatively cost effective and efficiently for our clients. And so basically the way the process works is our client will have a target of about uh, adults 25 to 54, which as we all know is a very broad target, 126 million people. And whether, again, whether you're a startup or AT&T, you will never have enough money to go out and target 126 million people. $2 billion is not enough, right? And so certainly if you have a little bit less than that, it's not enough. Right? So then what we do is we take our unique process, again, like a uh, process where we code the individual households, and then we filter them based off of key criteria. It could be a behavior. We like to typically stay, uh, stick with a behavior or an attitude, right? and also some type of purchase uh, uh, or revenue number within there. And then from there what we do is we'll take the data and we'll throw it up onto a four-quadrant chart. And, I'd love to take the time to explain what I'm showing you here. But really what we're trying to do is that gold bubble is what we're trying to get to is where is our best opportunity, right? And so what we'll do is we'll size the market, show the revenue implications, show, uh, and show any other pertinent information, right? And so that, what that'll do is it'll cut our opportunity from everyone down to 5, 10, 15, 20% or somewhere in that area, right? And so from there, where this then takes us, is and on this chart you see some basic demographic, uh, media behavior, and some psychographic and attitudinal information, right? And then probably for most of our clients, especially our very uh, cost-conscious clients, uh, this slide is is the one that they really wait for, and and basically what this chart is showing you is the top two gold bubbles that are highlighted are two programs, TV programs, and you can see their rating. Well. Still today, most TV uh, media people, when they go in to buy TV, they buy off of these ratings. The problem is, is that you're not interested in everyone. You're interested in your best customer, right? And our process allows us to actually get an actual Nielsen TV rating against our current target. And so as you see the bottom two bubbles, you see the ratings shift significantly. A 0.75 becomes a 0.1, a 1.11. And obviously, you see the other program on the right goes from a 0.81 to a 0.7. Right, and you see the, the cost per point change there at the bottom, right? And so you see a significant shift, and that's just one program. And a lot of times when we do this for clients, our, for the first year, we'll see a 15 to 20 percent uh, improvement in their overall TV buy. And if every dollar is important to you, which I think for most of our clients it is, um, this becomes very, very important. And our segmentation process takes anywhere between two to four weeks. That's a pretty insane timeline for segmentation. Sometimes it takes a little longer just depending on data issues and things like that. But our, our, our goal is not to, not to overcomplicate it. Um, the previous speaker talked about 
trying to keep it simple, keep it efficient. That's what we try to do at Mullen, right? So this is our basic approach to um, segmentation. Obviously, we have tons of, we do persona work. Uh, we work with the str strategic and the creatives, and so we can make this as fancy as possible. But at the end of the day, we work with a lot of startups, right, who don't have the money to pay for all the other stuff. What they really want to know is, help me my first year to two years, and then let's drive, then we can get to the, to, to the other stuff that's more expensive that really could help our, our, our company. But right now, if I don't make goals this year, I'm not around next year, right? So, so that's segmentation. Right, so I'm going to turn it over to John Turner, and he's going to walk you through our philosophy on advanced analytics. Yeah, so uh, as Patrick had said, uh, we deal with a lot of companies of very varying sizes. So one of the key things we have to do is make sure that the models and analytics we run are appropriate for the business problems that we're actually dealing with. So I'm going to take you through a few constructs that we actually use to help deciding which models to run and what to do. So starting off uh, just within general media, what you see up on the slide is a, this is Nielsen Basie's 12 Steps of Consumer Adoption. For those not familiar with Basie's, it's the largest new product forecasting brand restage company in the world. And this model works from everything from shave cream to iPhone, and the processes go. What you discover is we're a, me we're a private media company. We need to analyze media. Media drives two-thirds of the consumer adoption process, from creating interest to communicating clearly the message, getting understanding, to driving attraction leading to purpose. Most models fu function at the end of that process on measuring how the conversion to purchase occurs. If your problem is earlier on, you don't, you're not really using the right model to address it. So understand your consumer adoption process. The other problem is most models look very short term. This is a study that IRI did, which looked at how media impacted sales, not just in the year the media ran, but they actually had markets where media was turned off for up to three years. And they saw that media that ran in year one actually impacted sales all the way out to year two. Vitally important, especially in industries with high price promotion, everyone looking at the short term, short term sales drive up very quickly generally higher than TV, but they have no long-term impact. So make sure you understand whether you're looking at long-term or short-term impacts and taking into account the long-term for a long-term healthy business. What this really comes down to is saying a lot of modeling is lower funnel analysis. Keep, up, keep the upper funnel in mind. The, the path to purchase, the advertising half-life, how long you're advertising, Last is category dependent. The spend is media dependent. Uh, media mix modeling does not work with long half lives and flat spend, no variation. Also, long paths to purchase, media effectiveness, uh, and purchase are not highly related in the short term. They tend to be long term. So make sure you look at the covered and complete upper area of the funnel. Having said that, lower funnel analysis is really important. However, we tend to overcomplicate everything. Understand what you're doing. It, it can help in two main areas, and this is a good way to think about it. Is this really a budget allocation issue, or is it a real-time optimization? So a budget allocation is, how much should I be spending on each channel? How should I be spreading my media dollars around? Real-time optimization is saying, in digital, in TV, how do I optimize each one of those? Budget allocation tends to need complex models because you're making real budget decisions. Real-time optimization is really just about making it better. So you only need relative. So you can build much simpler models. Also, the way that you actually go to market and the channel dynamics that you actually have determine which model is best. So if you primarily have an existing strategy you're trying to improve, then modeling on historical data with either media mix or attribution models works. If you're trying something completely new, no matter how much modeling you do of what happened in the past, totally irrelevant, a lot of work done, no value driven. So then you have to go and do a test and learn or market uh, on the market or the consumer. Looking at uh, existing strategies, there are two types of main models, media mix, attribution. Attribution works well for online only. There are companies that try and integrate offline. Generally, doesn't work that well. Uh, we've not had great success. 
until we've combined media mix model with attribution models. Then when you layer over the optimization with the budget allocation, what you find is you do different models. And what it really comes down to is focusing in on simplifying the model to the point you don't do any work you don't need to do. So for instance, in media mix modeling, if you're trying to optimize a channel, just simply focus the detail on that channel, use high level information on the other channels. But if you're trying to allocate your entire budget, especially if it's large, you will need full media detail. So how does that actually work in practice? Uh, one of the questions we're, we've been asked uh, within Marlin was talking about how would we actually go and model Halo for, ac for Acura. So what we were trying here was to say, Halo from television, which one of these brands should you put the most money on to drive entire portfolio sales? So what you find is that's really about television advertising. So in building a Halo model, looking at the cross impacts of sales, you do very high level digital, very high level price, very high level economic factors, put all the detail in the, in the TV, split it out into different streams of media for the MDX, the RLX, and the total Acura brand, but put the detail where you are trying to ask the question. Similarly, for attribution modeling. Uh, one of the things that happens with attribution modeling, that's a purely optimization strategy. So for instance, for those who don't fully understand attribution modeling, what you actually do is take all the touch points with the consumer and you allocate how much of that drove the end sale. One of the things to keep in mind as you do attribution modeling, that assumes that every single path is equally incremental. This does not say anything of what would, that person would have done if they weren't touched at all by any media. They may still well, would have bought. So as you go in with the results of a lot of attribution modeling, unless you have non-converted paths, you're not getting the full story. And I'll hand it over to Jeff. Thanks, John. So the biggest questions that I get from a social media perspective are, what am I getting for what am I paying? And I think we can all relate to that. So I don't have the answer, uh, full disclosure. But uh, we take a slightly different approach. And I have about 30 seconds to talk it through, but hopefully we can, we can get through it. So it's really about changing the value paradigm. So on the left, we're seeing traditional bottom line metrics. So understanding what click-through rates are, understanding our impression data, anything from a digital reconciliation perspective. While social, that's also digital. Can't we just simply put that into the bottom line? The answer is no. And the reason being is because whenever we try to shoehorn what's called traditional social media metrics, what happens is that we lose a lot of the value that social is actually driving. And there's been a series of tools that we're starting to curate at Mullen that is allowing us, or that are allowing us right now, to really have a, a very good understanding of what our social audience value is. So if we look at some of the different ways we're looking at social, through influence, buzz, and tenders, but really what it comes down to is the marriage between audience analytics and how they behave, not just in social, but how we can leverage those behaviors in other channels. So what does that mean? We take a step back and we look at social as a continuum. Really, there's a lot of anomalies there and a lot of outliers. So Facebook and Twitter, fine, those are the biggest drivers. But for us, they're very different, and the way that we approach them should be different. Now, that's not to say Pinterest and others don't provide value. As a matter of fact, they do. But putting them on the same plane from a value perspective and our view is erroneous. And the reason being is because they drive distinctive value, each and unto itself. And so the way that we do things at Mullen is understanding what the drivers are and what the challenges are, and how can we align one or any of these channels to be able to achieve that success, and then understanding what the value is that we're driving. So from a social media measurement approach, we really look at three things. So brand, audience, and competition. From a brand perspective, how are we being perceived? From an audience perspective, who is our social audience? And not just social as it relates to Facebook fans, but Twitter, Pinterest, et cetera. And then competition. Is our competition disparaging us? Or are, is our competition doing things that we might be able to leverage in our own channels? We're not above stealing. So we talk about social audience analytics, and this is really what, what gets me fired up. Um, we use a series of tools that allow us to 
understand who our social audience is. Now, this is primarily Facebook-centric, and you'll see uh, up top, this is some of the stuff that we worked with Acura. Um, but on the left, what we're seeing here is a data visualization of brand affinities. So from an Acura perspective, we have an understanding that we have a prestige problem. And we know that our competitors are doing a better job on that continuum. So we have some work to do. How do we know that? Well, we could take an informal poll here. But I think what's better is having objective first party data allowing us to have that conversation with our clients saying, we are losing. And we are losing in key demographics that should be buying our cars, but who are not. And so if we look at the right, now we're having a cut, a breakdown of who these audience members are to give us a little more information. Now, typical third-party Facebook data, as we know, uh, gender, geography, and that's all well and good. But we're very interested in who these buying intenders are. And we know that they exist not only in the social channels, but in the digital channels as well. So if we look at a schematic like this, we have information that can inform digital and CRM strategies. Here we have basically a competitive analysis. Uh, you guys may have seen this as post-acumen. Uh, it's a cool data schematic, but it allows us to have an understanding of where we rank against the people we care about. So if we take Acura, Lexus, Infinity, and to a lesser degree, some of the German brands. But it's good to have a benchmark of what they're doing as opposed to what we're doing on a daily basis. Is it going to inform movement for us? Maybe, maybe not. But given the dynamic nature of social, we really think it's incumbent upon us as agencies to have a very good understanding of what's being said about us at any one time. So you guys just saw the slide from John. Uh, I'm going to reuse it. But we talk about a social role in, in digital attribution. So as we see in social, we have the primary metrics that we've talked about between buzz and sentiment uh, and then leveraging audience analytics and other channels. But there's also going to be secondary and tertiary level metrics that we don't like to start to put on a bottom line continuum. But it's important to know that they're here. So the truth to you, we'll talk a little bit about this in a Zappos case study in a minute. Um, but we see that you know, from an impression perspective, we know that we had some type of lift given some type of social media placement. It's good to know. It's good to have an understanding of where that fits in our measurement continuum but not to rely so heavily on did this social placement drive a bottom line metric? Because that's a scary thing. Now, from a Facebook goals perspective, what we're trying to really understand is, I keep harping on this, but it's important to understand, uh, is audience engagement metrics. So using Facebook as our baseline to be able to inform digital placement from a segmentation perspective but also our CRM strategy that Chris will talk about in a bit. But being able to marry the attributes of all of those audiences and allowing for efficiencies and optimizations in a dynamic environment is something that we're trying to catalyze through social. <coughs> so here we have an example of how we've taken some of this social auto, uh, audience analytics data and married it with nine different audiences with another client of ours uh, from a CRM perspective. Right now, this client is on the ground level of developing their CRM strategy. And we are employing social data to be able to inform these different audience intenders. And if we start at the bottom, we have low-level intenders. And we can develop strategy in a real-time environment that pushes our low levels up to our higher levels. Finally, if we look at a continuum from uh, a corporate site perspective, we have social there. Now, again. This is really more of a tertiary data point. We know that social, in some cases, is going to drive to a corporate website environment, landing page environment, and there will be some type of success metrics being generated. But again, it's important to understand and take some context of how these things are being driven. We try not to use social to sell or promote, but we know that some of that is happening. Putting it down on a continuum, understanding that value, will allow us to make smart decisions from a social media perspective. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Thanks. Uh, so as Patrick mentioned, it's my first week here at Mullen. Fourth day at Mullen, fifth day living in Boston. Um, and here I am talking to 300 people about CRM and our Mullen approach to CRM. Um, I even have a makeshift badge, and my name's not on the list, so I'm not <laughs> new. Um, homemade, as it were. Um, so as we think about CRM, my role really with, within the Mullen environment and the CRM environment at Mullen 
is to take the analytics and insight and data um, and really create customer-centric strategies from that. So I'm not an analyst, as some of these guys are. I'm the guy that takes the analytics and the insight that builds programs uh, that drives value out of the customer base. And you know, CRM can't really exist. It doesn't exist, and it's not really a CRM program unless it has uh, data and analytics at the heart and the lifeblood of that program. Uh, without that data analytics, without segmentation and modeling, it's just an email program or it's just a direct mail program. It's not really CRM, and that's, that's how we believe. Um, we really think of, of CRM as much as developing relationships and managing those relationships with our customers uh, as much as it is about developing branded experiences. And it's something that Patrick talked about earlier um, in terms of hyper-bundling. It's, it's really omni-channel um, approach, not just integrated approach, not just integrated data and integrated marketing. It's omni-channel. Delivering that branded experience regardless of the channel in which you're communicating to the customer and having that seamless, seamless experience. Um, I can't read that from here. I had my eyes lasered about three weeks ago, um, and they're still a little bit sore, so I'm going to move over here and read from here if you don't mind. Um, really starts with smart segmentation, and when we say smart segmentation, it's not just a one-size-fits-all. For different brands, for different categories, and different brands within those categories, we'd have different segmented approaches um, from a recency, frequency, value approach, um, if it's high frequency, uh, to a lifestyle, lifestyle, life stage approach. Uh, for different categories, if it's a long buy cycle like the automotive industry, it might be a, a life stage or a lifestyle kind of approach to segmentation. And that really drives our integrated, our omni-channel marketing strategies, regardless of channel, whether it's email, direct mail, whether it's an event, whether it's TV, direct TV, all feeds into that CRM approach and omni-channel, delivering that experience to the consumer uh, regardless of, of, of uh, um, the channel itself. Um, and we have to consider um, customer contact preferences, so channel um, as well as content. Um, I'm not just don't think, do I want to receive email, do I want to receive direct mail, but what kind of content do I want to receive, how do I want to consume that content, on what devices do I want to consume that content, and deliver those communications in the most relevant and compelling way for those consumers, which ultimately delivers engaged and loyal customers, so it's not just about acquisition. We have to consider acquisition on the channel they came through to us as a customer, but also how we then communicate to deliver and, and, and build that customer value over time which in itself feeds with smarter segmentation. Uh, so we take that engagement, we take those transaction levels, whether it's actually purchasing a product or just engaging with a brand through social media, and actually deliver even smarter segmentation. So it's almost a continuous loop um, through that cycle. I'm going to skip this because it says almost the same thing. Uh, just a bit of color. I've kind of voiced that over already. Um, and then just finally, uh, in the different types of segmentation that we execute, you know, you have demographic uh, segmentation, which feeds life cycle campaigns. So anything from acquisition through engagement all the way through that life cycle, ultimately into not just retention, but advocacy uh, towards a brand, consumer advocacy towards your brand, so they can communicate. It's, it's not just one-to-one -one anymore. It's, it's one-to-one -to, -one to many. Um, so we can get our consumers, our best customers, to advocate our brand through CRM uh, to their, their network of friends through social media. Um, we have behavioral segmentation, uh, looking at promotional campaigns and how people can behave with a brand, and then ultimately into predictive um, uh, segmentation as well, so looking at how they're likely to behave uh, going forward, uh, feeding life stage, feeding behavior. So there's you know, what customers are like and how they behave now, behavioral segmentation, how they transact with our brand and our category, and how they're likely to transact, ultimately delivers insight to us about how they behave, what they prefer to receive, how they prefer to um, consume content, and also how they can become more profitable over time. And really, that's the ultimate game for, uh, aim for, for CRM, to drive more profitable customers out of the base that we have. So it's not just sending the right message to the right person or the right offer to the right person at the right time. It's through the right channel um, and through the right means. That's me. <laughs> so clearly, we all are here because part of us somewhere we're data geeks and we know with all the conversation happening around data we know data is king right now everyone wants to have data driven insights everyone's probably seen house of cards and knows the story how that came about uh, but really what it is at Mullen is data is king only if we let it be and that's because of data paralysis we have a lot of clients who have a lot of data and then they want to see it all um, and when I say they want to see it all I mean Literally, they want to see it all. Um, and it is about breaking the habit. Um, when you talk to a client and you ask them, what, what is it that you want this campaign to do? They're probably like three things they'll talk about. They'll talk about revenue. They're going to talk about some brand metrics. And then they're going to talk about making sure that they're getting the right audience. Um, 
this, on the other hand, will be very, very useful for the program manager who's optimizing the campaign. But to a CMO, this is a lot of information that doesn't really tell him anything about what the business is doing. Um, and that's why I think the approach we have at Mullen is really two basic questions. What are you trying to achieve? And how will we know you're being successful? And the reason why I have that little tablet over there is because we had this one client. We send them a dashboard, and the CMOs decided that they want to see a weekly report. And they email us and be like, well, we could send them this dashboard, but it's a lot of information. He's going to open it on his iPad and not going to read anything. Can you guys do something that's going to be on his iPad? And we're like, you know what? Yeah, we do, because Patrick does that. He walks into a meeting, and he's got his iPad. And if, it's, if he can't see it on his iPad, we know he's not read that email. <laughs> Uh, so keeping a boss in mind, that's what we did is for this client, is just give, give the CMO what he wants with probably three bullet points. That's something else we've learned um, over the years, three bullet points. No one is reading anything beyond three bullet points. Most of us are reading emails on our cell phones, and I do that to my team all the time. I'm like, if you send me an email that I need to scroll, I'm not reading it. Um, and this is why I think that's one of our approaches um, at Mullen is give the client what they need. It's not about data. It's not about information. It is about insights. Uh, we've spoken a lot about media, um, Jeff, Chris, Patrick, John. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how in a hyper-bundle approach we can actually influence creative. Mullen is a creative agency. We come up with brilliant creative, probably one of the best creatives I've seen um, in market. And um, we're proud to say that we help drive those creatives. And I'm going to use Zappos as um, the case study because it's a fun brand. It's a quirky brand. And it's probably one of the best creatives I have seen and worked on. The challenge with Zappos was everyone on their logo, they have a shoe. Everyone knows you can buy shoes on Zappos. But they also sell clothes. And they also sell a lot of other things. Um, at one point, they were like, OK, we know shoes. We want our customers and new customers to start buying clothes. We want our campaign to focus on that. That was the directive that we had gotten. So we knew they want to increase their shoe sales. Going back to the two questions, shoe sale, sorry, clothing sales is what they wanted to do. At the same time, what we knew was consideration and purchase intent for them was an issue. Um, based on tracker information, we had seen that Zappos has a phenomenal awareness. They have an 85% awareness. But when it comes to clothing, the consideration and purchase intent was definitely an issue for them. What we wanted to understand was what was driving that? What was it with the customers that wasn't getting them to think about Zappos from a clothing perspective? Our approach was using Brand Tracker. Yes, we use the Brand Tracker data in a very, very different manner. Typically, when a client gets a Brand Tracker, it's an 80-page deck with all these graphs about how they're doing compared to their com competitors. And then they look at it once, and then it's put it away. We took that raw data, and we, want, we got insights out of it. Um, I know. Did you just put that? OK. I swear I saw that. Um, so what we did is we want to look at overall, and we want to look at for their target, how, what are the things that basically causing issues with consideration and visit. At the same time, we wanted to understand how is Zappos performing compared to the competitors. Because at the end of the day, if they're not buying from Zappos, they're buying from somewhere, someone else. So what we saw was, for, from a consideration perspective, we saw high quality free shipping and great selection. Those were the things that consumers are thinking about when they're thinking about buying um, either clothes or shoes or anything from a retailer. At the same time, we also saw was that was doing at par. So we knew our messaging was doing at par um, prior to the shift in the messaging, the directive that we had gotten from a client, the focus was in customer service. Zappos has amazing customer service. Uh, you guys might have heard of the story where they actually delivered pizza to someone because someone called them and they asked, where's the closest pizza place? And they're like, oh, we'll take care of you. Um, so we know that they have great customer service. Um, but at the same time, what we found out based on the tracker is that really people weren't thinking about customer service when they wanted to go shop at a retailer. We also saw from a visitation perspective, again, it was free shipping, great selection, and good value. That was what people were looking at. And good value, we kind of explored that a little bit further, because it's like, is it, is it a brand name, or is it a price point? Is it that they're looking for promotions, because Zappos does not have discounts? So those were the things that we started digging into as we were thinking about our campaign strategy. 
NPS, Zappos have phenomenal NPS. Everyone loves Zappos. They love to talk about Zappos. We knew that there wasn't a problem, and we also knew that um, once people explored Zappos, they knew that they had great selection. So this is what we found from an overall perspective. We did the same thing by looking at just for clothing, because at the end of the day, our message had to drive that clothing um, sales for them. What we saw from a consideration and visit perspective, it was pretty similar. So we were like, this is great news for us, so that when we go with a campaign, we can actually have one campaign that's not going to hurt their shoe business, but at the same time drive their clothing business. What we found fascinating over here with the promote was that they actually had other things around customer service that kind of came, came back up on promote. So this was something where we honestly took a sigh and we were like, great, at least we knew that what we were doing is like helping them with the word of mouth, which is really critical um, in the retail business. Women like to talk about uh, where they shop. So with all this, this was the executive summary that went out to the client basically saying, your, cl your, your customers love you. And we did kind of walk them through the entire thing so they knew what were the reasons. And the focus of our messaging should be on great selection, good value. So any creative that's going out needs to be able to show that you have the breadth and depth of selection, you have that value, and then you have free shipping because that's critical um, when it comes to online. It's table stake, but you still sometimes have to pay for shipping, which irks the hell out of me. Uh, this is the birth of More Than Shoes campaign. Um, you guys might have seen it. You might have seen the big Yahoo takeover that had happened where we had um, the streaker running through. Um, I know Patrick had told me put the video, but that's... No video? Was, it's a three-minute video. You gave me five minutes. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, the, so this is a campaign, and the way we had, media team did a really good job with buying it because we had a lot of information we wanted to put. They had a full page ad, and whenever you saw a print full page ad, it had a one third, that banner, which basically showed you the selection and the brand names that Zappos carries along with the free shipping. So it really did, the creators did a fantastic job of like taking all the different pieces that we wanted them to hit in their creative. What that did is people who were exposed to our ad advertising results speak for themselves. They saw an increase in their apparel sales from 8% to 15%. So overall, this campaign was extremely successful for that purpose. With that, if anyone has any questions, I don't know if we have time. We've covered one or two things. Okay. Yes. Um, so you talk about how media drives sales, but when you're working with clients that might be that might have lower budgets or maybe local clients, what is is there a certain dollar amount that the client needs to spend in order for that media to drive sales? Uh, that it, it depends a little bit on what the what you need to do from a media perspective uh, the biggest threshold you get is on being able to create awareness you need to spend at what we call reasonable levels it's normally 100 200 thousand we found with most clients uh, to actually drive awareness if you have uh, sufficient awareness among your target because you've been around for a long time then if your media is just all lower funnel then if you really target the media very, very well, then almost any level of spending can actually drive sales. But the hard piece is the, the, the upper level funnel where you, you have to, it's very hard to hit that target with branded messages uh, with sufficient frequency to actually drive the awareness. I have a question to you, um, John, right? About yep. media mix, when you mentioned about media mix and uh, channel attribution and allocation of the percentages of um, uh, if you're planning the uh, campaign through different channels, right? So you mentioned that uh, some of the percentages we kind of assume that it's going to be equally attributed, but also if we look into historical data, you can come up with a different insight about the percentage allocation based on the historical data. I understand that if you're running tests for the future, then you're kind of assuming everything is equally attributed by looking to historical data. You can um, predict which percentages would that be, even though it's kind of assuming, but still based on some statistical evidence. Yes, yeah, uh, I, sorry, I probably wasn't clear. 
What I was saying there is, when, with however you do the attribution, and you can do attribution, last click, first click, equal weight, or Markov chain analysis, and, and weight it all on historical, whatever you're doing there, that does not tell you how incremental any of that was. So it, what, because all of those models, or 95% of them, only work on converted paths, everyone who's in there is exposed to media. What you don't get is, what would have those people have done anyway? So you don't know the real how to allocate the media really effectively, because you may have sold to everyone anyway, even if you hadn't done it. It's like Duracell does campaigns when a hurricane's coming. People are going to buy batteries. <laughs> yeah. I have a question, too. Um, you mentioned earlier on uh, you have 25 analysts working am among your team, um, and you know, we, we're, we've talked about the myriad of different data sources that are utilized to produce these insights, and the analytics are done on top of those. What kind of tools and, and, and you know, sort of general tips and tricks do, do, do they use and do you all use to be able to marry those data sources together, particularly when they're coming from, you know, maybe pulling data out of cloud sources and different on-prem sources at your customer site, for instance? That's a, that's a great question. And uh, early on, we need, uh, when I started, I said we need to find a tool that allows us to get to the most granular level with the broadest at the broadest level at the broadest uh, uh, base and so we we partnered with Nielsen because we love them or hate them right they've got some of the best data out there and they've spent the money uh, to figure it out and so we're we, we subscribe to data like Nielsen Prism right that it's coded 85% of all US households 85% of US households it's a lot there's no other system out there anywhere close to that number and so that, because of that, and because Nielsen owns about everything, it allows us to tie back to uh, a lot of that great data. Um, but we also partner with other companies, and obviously with our clients, to go out and code data as well, to be able to, to, um, to utilize those tools. And actually, you bring up a really important point around tools. I mean, we have a, we're like everybody else, we have a ton of tools, right? And tools are critical, don't get me wrong, but it's hiring the right people to make sure that they know how to pull those insights out of those tools for you. Because a lot of times p people spend a lot of money on these tools and aren't getting the insights really to help drive their business. So that's a great question. And just to add on from an analyst perspective, our analysts typically will use SAS and Tableau to make their lives easier to pull the data, consolidate, and then mm -hmm. do any kind of data visualization and stuff like that. Yep. Great question. That was great, Team Mullen. Thank you. Uh, it's easy to see why you guys are one of the top 10 most innovative agencies in the country. Uh, given all the work that you're doing um, for your clients, it's pretty spectacular to see that marriage of creative data and tech um, really bring to life a brand promise. So. Thanks again to the team at Mullen for all the prep that went into this and, and sharing your insights. I hope you guys can stick around for a little bit in case people have more questions. But I wanted to keep moving on. We're going to take a little break so we can pull the air wall here. Um, and we're going to break off into two breakout rooms. This is going to be breakout room A. Yes. That's A. That's B. Am I screwing you up? OK. That's A. Scratch that. That's A. That's B. Um, refer to your one-page agenda so you can see um, what is going on where. What you're going to see with the breakouts is you're going to get a lot more sort of into the dirty details and case studies on um, some of the ways people are using data and analytics. So there are definitely more, um, a lot of detail, uh, some great case studies from Ford, from T. Rowe Price, from um, Google, um, other organizations who will show you really how it's done. So please make sure you come back in 10 minutes and be on time. And go out the side doors and visit with our sponsors um, and uh, each other and find out what everybody is learning today. Thanks.